The Misfits by James Howe. Chapter 1. So here I am, not a half hour old as a tile salesman and trying to look like I know what I'm doing, which have got to be two of the biggest jokes of all time, when who should walk in to Ockworth and Ames department store but Skeezy Tukas. Now ordinarily I would be happy to see Skeezy, don't get me wrong. In my book he's a fine fellow, although I have heard him referred to more than once as that young hooligan. I suspect this may have to do with his fondness for black leather jackets and slicked back hair, combined with a certain carelessness in the area of personal hygiene, and what I guess you might call a direct manner of speaking, even to those of a more advanced generation. But all I can say is that if you're willing to dig below the surface, you will discover the real Skeezy Tukas, and there you will find a heart as big a heart as ever was produced by the little town of Paintbrush Falls, New York. If I seem to be going on at some length to defend a character you have barely met, remember, I myself have only just glimpsed him coming toward me through the ladies' wear and accessories, batting at the rows of white cotton nightgowns with hands that look as if they may have spent the previous twenty minutes digging a nickel out of a recently tarred road. If, as I say, I am defending him before you've even met him, it is because of the look on my boss's face, as he, too, beholds Skeezy's approach. The manager of the men's wear and accessories department is a Mr. Kellerman, although I have already learned that employees under a certain age refer to him as Killer Man. Apparently, he only smiles in private, if then, and he certainly isn't smiling this particular Friday afternoon. It is highly irregular, he told me right off the bat when I showed up for work after school, to hire a 12-year-old as a tie salesman. Yes, sir, I said, trying to hide my light under a bushel, as my father had that morning advised me. He told me it might not pay off to show he might not pay to show off how smart I am. Well, I may be smart, but I did not get what a light and a bushel had to do with each other or anything at all, for that matter, but at that moment that was beside the point. I suspect it still is. Stock boy, fine. Killer Man went on, polishing his glasses with the fine silk handkerchief he'd pulled out of the breast pocket of his grey flannel blazer. It is only September, and it is still hot in Paintbrush Falls, even if we are pretty far north. But Killer Man has decided, I guess, that the season dictates grey flannel. I worked as a stock boy over the summer, I told him. I am aware of that, Killer Man said. In the lawn furniture and garden department... Yes, it's on your record. He snapped his silk handkerchief in my direction, then shoved it back in his pocket with, well, there's no other word for it, panache. You have to hand it to the guy. He has style, even if he has the personality of a doorstop. Well, he said, sighing dramatically, it seems that I am stuck with you. Only two afternoons a week. I pointed out, and the occasional Saturday. I shall remember to count my blessings. Yes, sir, I said. So Killerman hasn't taken his eyes off me the whole half hour I've been standing here, trying to look like I know what I'm doing, although in point of fact I have been doing zip. When along comes, of all people, Skeezy Tukas, on whom Killerman is now getting ready to move in and he doesn't even know yet that this young hooligan is my friend. And all I'm thinking is once he does, I'm done for. I'll be canned before I box my first tie. And I don't even want to think about what my father would have to say about it. I decide to head trouble off at the pass. I make my move. Excuse me, Mr. Kellerman, I say. I think I see a customer who needs my assistance. If you are referring to that young hooligan... Killer Man says. You could chip ice off the words. Security will take care of him. Don't waste your time. Oh, it's not a waste of my time, Mr. Kellerman, I say. Then, remembering something I read in the six stapled pages awkward the names gives its new employees, I add, a customer waiting for assistance is a friend waiting to be made. Killer Man grimaces, but there's not a whole lot he can say to that. I smile a little smugly. I suspect some of my light is leaking out from under its bushel. What are you doing here? 
I hiss at Skeezy. I do not mean to be hostile, but with Killerman hanging out behind me like a vulture in the wind, I've got to act fast. The question is, what are you doing here? Skeezy asks back. Jeez, look at you. Tie and all. He starts to finger my tie, but I don't let him. It's not mine, I tell him. If I get it dirty, I have to pay for it out of my salary. What kind of stinking rule is that? Skeezy retorts. Is that your boss over there, the Grim Reaper? I'm going to go right over them and tell him what kind of stinking rule is that. I put my hand on Skeezy's chest. Don't, I say. Okay, I need this job. If my dad didn't used to work here, I wouldn't have this job. So do not mess it up for me. Do you hear what I'm telling you, Skeezy? Are you reading me loud and clear? With Skeezy, sometimes it's important to say things more than once. Yeah, fine, says Skeezy. I get it. But maybe I'll write a letter to Mr. Awkward the Names. You do that, I say. I'll bet Mr. Awkward and Ames are dead, he goes, picking at his teeth with a grotty thumbnail. I mean, the store is like a thousand years old, man. Who shops in here anyway? I do not have an answer for this. In my half hour as a junior tie salesman, I have not seen another living soul, except for Kel Killer Man, who is questionably living and arguably without a soul, and now Skeezy Tukas, who is definitely not shopping, except maybe for trouble. We stop talking for a minute, and I wonder when the skis is going to get down to business and tell me the purpose of his visit. Killer Man harumphs in the background. So what's up? I say at last. I gotta get back to work. Yeah, that boss of yours is burning holes in your shirt with his eyes. I hope it's yours at least. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay for the damaged goods out of your salary. Very amusing. So, I repeat, what's up? Skeezy puts a filthy hand on my shoulder, and I am glad the shirt I am wearing is, in fact, my own. Bobby, he says, giving me that deep look he uses to hypnotize his victims when he's about to hit them up for something. Only this time he isn't hitting me up for anything other than my attention. Bobby, he says again, what day of the week is it? Friday, I give back. And what happens on Fridays after school? I go to work at the Awkward and Ames department store. As of when? As of today. And what, may I ask, about the forum? The forum, I say stupidly because I know exactly of what he is speaking. Skeezy squeezes his eyes tight and nods his head back and forth like he's in pain or something. Only, I know it isn't pain, because I know this look of his, and what it is, is he's telling you how disappointed he is in you. Like you've done some terrible thing that has just put a dent in the perfect silver goblet that is his life. Bobby, 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 he croons, his eyes still squeezed up as tight as if there were a whole pan of frying onions right there in front of him. Listen, I tell him, I gotta go. I'm sorry about the forum. Maybe we can do it another day. Skeezy's eyes pop open like his head is a car that's just been rear-ended. Another day? Did I hear you right? What about tradition, my man? I got two people sitting down the street at the candy kitchen sitting in our booth, Bobsters, the back booth with the torn rather leather at upholstery. They have sent me as their emissary because we cannot begin the forum until all are present and accounted for. And you are telling me another day? Mr. Goodspeed, I hear behind me. It's the voice of the executioner. Really, I gotta go, I tell Skeezy. Skeezy removes his hand from my shoulder and brushes it off on his jeans like he's just picked up some germs or something from my clean shirt and says, you can't let us down, man. And I say, I don't get out of work until five. Tell Addie and Joe I'm sorry. Maybe I can get my day switched here and next Friday... Skeezy walks away, shaking his head. Killer Man harumphs again and says behind my back, Perhaps next Friday you will no longer be working here at all, Mr. Goodspeed. And I think, how come life always has to be so complicated? Will it get any easier when I'm an adult? And then my dad's life comes to mind, and I think, no way. 
A few minutes later, I'm watching Killer Man from out of the corner of my eye, and he's standing there tapping his foot and checking his watch, waiting, I figure, for a customer to show up or another day to end, and I'm guessing his life isn't complicated at all. But I'm also guessing that it isn't happy. What Killer Man's life mostly comes down to, I figure, is waiting. All of a sudden, my mixed-up, pre-adolescent life seems pretty good. Even working as a tie salesman at Ockworth and Ames department store seems pretty good. Because I'm only 12, and I'm just passing through. Mr. Kellerman is stuck here for the rest of his life, with his silk color-coordinated ties and pocket handkerchiefs, waiting every day for a voice to announce, Shoppers, the store will be closing in 15 minutes. And when the store does close, where does he go? My mind draws a blank. 